Um, so good morning, everybody. I think um, you know, for those of you who have been here all morning, I think today um, this panel actually I think is going to be a capstone for a lot of the conversation that we've had over the course of the morning. Uh, when I think about uh, this panel and I think about um, the administration's management agenda that was released a year ago in March, if you remember, I won't give a test, there were three pillars of the President's management agenda. It was data, it was technology, and it was the workforce. And I think in the course of this morning's conversation, we've touched on each of those elements. And what I think we'll do in this panel, actually, is to talk a little bit about um, why is it critical to address these topics right now? And, and, and Robert's going to talk about that from a GAO perspective. And how do we better use the data that we have and the data that we can get? And I think the last dialogue um, sort of reinforces that we can do a lot better job of gathering data and then using it to, to improve our human capital program. And Caitlin's going to talk to that. And then Kim and Robert are going to talk about from their organization's perspective, what does this mean to them in the future? So I'm going to start by just asking each of the panelists to just briefly for like 30 seconds introduce themselves of the role that they play in their organization, and then we'll get started. Caitlin? Uh, my name is Caitlin McGregor. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Plum. We're a technology company that actually combines best practices from industrial organizational psychology uh, with technology to help enterprises and organizations capture people's innate talents, um, their employees and their job seekers, so they can make better talent decisions to optimize uh, people's performance. I'm Bob Gibbs. I'm the Chief Human Capital Officer and the Assistant Administrator at NASA. I guess we're a technology company as well. Sort of, kind of. I think we kind of fall in that space. I thought that would be a really bad pun. Fall in that space a little bit. Um, look, I think, you know, our, one of the Associate Directors at Langley put it this way for us when we talk about where we are as far as context goes. It's almost like the Matrix. How many of you have seen the Matrix? You can take a red pill and go back and assume life to be what you thought it was, or you can take the blue pill and really kind of see where life for what it is right now. And the reality is the world around us is changing. You know, the world around us, the world of work and how government gets its job done is fundamentally changing at a really rapid pace. And I think that all plays into a lot of the discussion we're having today. Thank you. Kim? Uh, good morning, my name is Kimberly Steed. I work for the Department of Treasury as their acting director for human capital strategic management. And I oversee human capital strategic planning for the Department of Treasury. I'm Robert Goldenkopf, and I'm a Director of Strategic Issues at the uh, U.S. Government Accountability Office, and I'm responsible for GAO's uh, studies of government-wide personnel issues. So Robert, why don't, we, uh, why don't we start with talking from a GAO perspective as to why human capital has been on the high-risk list for I don't know how many years now? Since 2001. Well, relatively recent. It's, it's been a long time, but obviously these have been some long-standing issues. Um, I got my start in this area. Actually, I was in college, started working as a volunteer for the original Volcker Commission, so that was in 1988. Um, so I just want to thank all of you uh, for all the work that you are doing on behalf of, of strengthening talent management within the federal government. These issues have been going on. I've seen it now for over 30 years. We need to get it right. You know, when I first started, um, uh, human capital management, talent management, it was seen as a back office function, very transactional. And I think over time, there's this growing recognition that um, the human capital function needs to be part of the, a strategic business function. They need to have a seat at the table. Um, the, uh, we've, uh, as, as Dave mentioned, uh, human capital management has been on GAO's high risk list since 2001. The reason for that is because mission critical skills gaps, both within federal agencies and also across government, are threatening the ability of the government to carry out its vital missions. So we're seeing this, for example, in occupations that uh, we are, are used by every federal agency, cybersecurity, acquisition, for example, um, all the STEM occupations. We're also seeing this in uh, agency-specific occupations, for example, doctors and nurses within um, VA. The interesting thing, if you look at GAO's high-risk list, there are 35 programs that are on GAO's high-risk list. We just issued our most recent report, our, our most recent high-risk list in 2019. 
Um, so human capital is one of those. So of the 34 other areas on GAO's high risk list, um, of those 34, human capital management played a contributory role in 16 of those areas. And that's interesting because if you only looked at the surface issue within each of those areas, if you didn't address the human capital part of it, you're not going to solve the problem. It's going to stay on our high risk list. The reverse is also true. If you focus on human capital management upstream, you can head off a lot of problems down the line. And so that's why it's, it's so important to us and why GAO uh, continues to focus on it. Um, you know, so we have the skills gaps, but um, you know, on top of just that, that initial problem of having the, the, the skills gaps, um, there are some additional challenges as well. First, as was already mentioned, um, demographics are not in the government's favor. Um, there are high levels of retirement eligibility across government. Uh, in 2017, we took a snapshot of the federal workforce in 2017. Um, of those permanent employees who are on board in 2017, uh, roughly a third will be coming up for, re will be eligible for retirement over the next five years. Um, and then some agencies have even higher levels of retirement eligibility. So agencies need to do a good job of really understanding the dynamics of their agencies. Who's coming? Who's going? Why are people leaving? How can we get people to stay? Of course, it also presents opportunities as well to, to um, reskill the workforce. Um, there are some structural issues as well. Um, first of all, and you know, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir about this, the very foundation of the federal personnel system, the Classification Act, the Civil Service Reform Act, they're decades old, they're outmoded, and they were designed for uh, a type of work and a type of workforce from a, a, a different era. Um, we've also found that key talent management strategies, or activities rather, um, things like, uh, or activities such as recruiter, recruiting, hiring, pay, performance management, engaging employees, um, those are all um, problematic and, and uh, um, uh, agencies need to do a, a better job um, in each of those areas. Um, so going forward, um, you know, I, I don't want to be very depressing here. Actually, I want to be, I, you know, this, no, this could I, be I, like no, a, I'm depressed a, just a, listening to you. I mean, <laughs> well, I know GAO I'm, tends to depress people. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so thank you for this support group. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there, you know so for, for GAO's part, what are we doing about this? Um, you know, we want to be part of the solution and not just identify problems, because we know how hard you all are, are working. Um, so, you know, the, the future, I mean, I always like to be optimistic, and, and I don't think the future is, is all that, that bleak. I mean, for, for our part, GAO, we're working with the Hill to focus on the statutory changes that need to take place. You know, for example, um, things like the classification system, pay, benefits, those all, you know, are, are in, in Congress's realm. Uh, because they do require some, some statutory changes. But there is so much that agencies can do on their own within existing flexibilities and authorities. And it's really just a matter of um, leadership, culture, and practice. So on leadership, you know, we're trying to work with agencies to, to focus on human capital, have leaders in place that know that human capital is so important um, to the mission of the agency, and that's sometimes not a, something that's seen by especially the political leaders um, on agencies. The focus is always on policy, and, and no one cares as much about, about management. Um, so we want leaders who will make sure that the human capital folks have a seat at the table. On the culture side, um, we're trying to get uh, agencies to um, focus on um, people values within agencies, respect and valuing people. Um, and then finally, and this is probably the, the largest area, is practice, making sure agencies are uh, taking advantage of um, best practices um, across the life cycle of federal employment. Everything from strategic workforce planning, making use of workforce analytics, um, performance management, employee engagement, diversity and inclusion. So I'll stop there and just like to hear from the others uh, sure. talk about your, your experiences within each of these areas. So Caitlin, let me, uh, thank you Robert. Let me, um, let me ask you to talk a little bit about this intersection 
between data, technology, and human capital. And, and I think following on David's uh, demonstration just before we came up here, you know, I think folks in the, in the audience are looking like, wow, I'd love to get that data. I'd love to be able to collect that data and actually use it in the human capital processes that we all operate. Could you talk a little bit about the experience and, and how you go about doing that? Yeah, so what we're really looking at is a shift in how we evaluate talent. Um, be that from the very beginning of today, talking about experience, workforce experience, and how we think about our people. Um, before, we used to think about almost cogs in a machine. Somebody was going to come in to do a role. And now we're seeing it becoming much more about personalization and a lot more about the experience an individual is happening, ha having. Um, we also heard in the panel before about time to hire, you know, about a metrics of getting a person in. And what we're seeing here is that there's an opportunity to think about things differently than before. And it starts with the type of data that we're utilizing to evaluate people. So in the past, um, most people were evaluated based on the contents of their resume, where they went to school and previously worked. What fascinated me when I got into this uh, about 10 years ago was that if you talk to an industrial organizational psychologist, they will tell you that there's well over four decades of research to show that where somebody went to school and previously worked, it may tell you if they're eligible to do the job, but it won't tell you, it won't be able to predict the future performance of the role. And the opportunity right now is to start evaluating people based on their potential. When we have an aging workforce, there is going to be this vacuum of leadership. We have to look at people's potential to fill that vacuum rather than the proof of have they done it yet. When we look at the changing nature of work, you know, 50% of today's jobs are going to be replaced by automation or displaced by automation. 65% of today's students are going to be applying for jobs that don't even exist yet. How can somebody on their resume say they did a job that, that doesn't even exist yet? So there's an opportunity to reevaluate uh, how we are actually measuring somebody. And so uh, I turned 10 years ago to industrial organizational psychology to say, okay, well, where is the science clear on predicting future performance, on not looking at eligibility, but looking at that potential for future performance? And so when we look at people's innate talents, things like their ability to innovate, to work well on teams, to execute. When we look at how people get a sense of self-worth, how, you know, what really truly drives them, and we align that internal innate talent with the requirements of the role, it actually doesn't matter if they've done it before, you can start to look at 100 people and predict which ones are more likely to succeed, you know, within the journey of that job over an extended period of time by aligning, you know, if they're incredibly innovative and this is a job where you have to come up with out of the box ideas, the people that truly enjoy coming out without coming up with out of the box ideas will perform better than the ones that just want to be told what to do and repeat that task or support others. And so we see this as an opportunity to collect new data. So most people have had access to psychometric assessments at some point. Um, most of the time we see it's focusing on high volume pre-employment assessments, or we see it the top 10% of the organization in directors and above. Uh, what we're seeing is an opportunity to democratize access to this highly predictive data, to start to really focus on allowing every employee and every job seeker as part of the data that they're sharing with employee employers is to be able to, through an assessment, complete a profile that allows people to showcase their talents and be evaluated based on their talents. And looking at the need to have that data on your job seekers and that data on your existing employees and being able to start to understand on a job level, not just the job description, not just a bunch of key words, but truly quantifying what are the talents needed for somebody to succeed in the job, and then matching them. And so that's really changing how our customers, a lot of them SAP customers, are thinking about succession planning. They're thinking about you know, actually doing career pathing, internal mobility based on potential. And what we're finding is a new type of the conversation. I, I loved, you know, Andy's example early on in his career. You know, he knew he had potential, but nobody else was identifying it. 
we, this will be my last point, we... <laughs> Could be Andy, too, I mean, you know. I, well, he's saying. been successful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we look at, especially in succession planning, at, um, you know, <coughs> high potential programs. You know, and that word is even outdated because it's very elitist. But when you understand people's innate talents, what you can do is across your entire organization, look at your emerging leaders. Look at your 20-year-olds and your 30-year-olds. Look at the people before they hit directors and above at who has the DNA for your organization to be an emerging leader right from the very first year of them joining your organization, which means that once they've been on the job for three or four years, you're not losing them to a competitor. You can actually make sure that you're helping them and bringing them along and keeping them and grooming them for those future positions. And so it's just rethinking about the fact that Gartner says by 2030, 75% of the workforce are going to be, be millennials. 10 years ago, we were talking about how to recruit millennials. It's not about recruiting them, it's about keeping them and making sure that as they replace you know, that one third of workforce that's going to be retiring, have we identified them now? Have we been able to nurture them and provide that personalized experience to match their innate talents with the opportunities within the organization? Okay, thanks, Caitlin. So let me, Bob, turn to you and, and talk a little bit about uh, NASA and your, your reaction to the changing environment. And I think all of us, you know, in the federal space, you know, every year when the partnership's best places to work comes out, you know, we yeah. all are envious. It's like, oh yeah, there's there's NASA again, yeah. number one. That's because we cheat. Because they're cool. We cheat. That's I how mean, we they're get to cool. They put year. people yeah. on the moon and you know do all sorts of you know really fascinating yeah. missions. But you know, as you and I were talking the other day, your world is changing now with yeah, the advent is. of competition. So yeah. how do you react to this now? So to, to build off what Robert said earlier, you know, I. The general schedule, the GS system, it's not up to the task of moving forward, just putting it out there. If it were a person to be 14 years past its retirement eligibility date, that's problematic to me. I'm not sure it can react quickly enough to the things that we need going forward for NASA. You know, our mission right now is to put the first woman and the next man on the moon by 2024. We don't even have some of those technologies, some of those capabilities and competencies and skills necessarily identified here as we sit here in 2019, but we have a hard deliverable in 2024. But I am incredibly optimistic that we're gonna be able to achieve this. We are gonna be able to put the first woman and the next man on the moon by 2024, because we've recognized that the world around us is changing so dramatically. You know, wasn't that long ago where NASA was the only game in town, right, for space exploration. Um, now we're a smaller percentage of the market, private market entrance. We have 125 international partners. We didn't have those partnerships three decades ago. I have 700 commercial partners that are helping us accomplish our mission. Our labor force is a very small percentage federal, and then the rest of it is partnerships external to NASA. So it's a different structure. It's a different world that you have to compete in. You have to understand, you know, and, and really bring it into your thinking that your strategic workforce plan is no longer a, a relic that sits on a, book, a bookshelf, right? It has to be something that can be operationalized. It has to be something that you probably get as much value of going through the process as you do the end result of some sort of a master plan, then being able to adjust those market conditions effectively. Um, but the number one takeaway that I would give everyone in this audience is that the world around you is changing. You know, and find out how that impacts and how do you play in that world successfully? How do you maintain your competitive advantage kind of going forward? Um, there is so much in there. There's so much richness in having those discussions and going through a strategic workforce planning exercise at an organizational level that you can draw into your business practices. You know, start questioning why. Why, why are we structured this way? Is this the best way to be structured? You know, the government always says, well, we need to be modeled more like the private sector. What does that mean? You know, what's the definition of being modeled more like the private sector? And what are those barriers? You know, we've had NASA, we've taken a very proactive step of working with private sector companies and understanding what they do well and what they don't do well to try and bring that thinking into the federal government. Um, but you've got to be willing to try. You know, one of the best um, pieces of advice we've gotten from folks uh, in a very successful private company was, go do it. You know, not hopefully there's no trademark infringement with Nike or anyone in that, that sort of a world, 
But you know, it just, you know, you have to try something different. What we have done in the past, if we're relying on what we've done in the past to be successful in the future, I am very concerned it won't be. You know, if you look at the way we have to, you know, work on our people business and, and make no mistake about it, NASA has great cool technology. What makes NASA different is its people. You know, it is our bread and butter. It is what makes us strong as an organization and ability to accomplish amazing things. It's the men and women of NASA. So, you know, kind of going forward, I, I think you have to be willing to look for alternatives and different ways of doing business. Identify barriers and structures, those things that institutionally you have to address. Some, some are hard fixes. Some require legislation, you know, uh, in the federal space. Some you can do yourself. You know, some you can lean forward and say, you know what, we're going to go try X, Y, or Z and try and find a way to be more effective. So. so a lot of, Robert, though, you're talking about changing the culture within mm -hmm. the organization, right? The hardest so, thing to do. It's the hardest thing and, to do. And how does, that, how does that impact in your recruitment of, let's say, millennials yeah. and then retaining them once you get in the door if they're sort of, you know, if they're more like looking forward and their yeah. culture is hey, we, this is how we got to the moon last time, let's just replicate it, it worked yeah. before. So the hardest barrier I think you, any organizational structure will have is always culture, right? And, and you know, for organizations that have been successful, there's a great logical reason behind it. This has worked, why are, we, why are we fixing what isn't broken kind of a theory. But I would argue that maybe in today's environment, in today's competitive marketplace for talent specifically, we have to look at things differently. You know, um, yes, we are one of the older workforces in the federal government, if you look at retirement eligibility data. But does that tell the whole story? When do people really retire? I mean, for some lines of my business, you know, folks aren't retiring um, very much. We have very low attrition at NASA. So maybe it isn't as pressing a problem as am I getting the talent coming in the other side? And how long are those folks staying? You know, is it okay that they leave NASA and go to work for a competitor and then come back? Well, if it, that's gonna be a modeled behavior, something we're okay with, we have to change some of the barriers which say, hey, if you come back, I only can hire you what you were. We have to lower the barriers to exit and entry if we're really looking at a very different total workforce picture. So I think these are some of the things that we have to work on across government to be more successful going forward. Kim, Treasury is a, is a very diverse you know, organization with, with the diversity of the bureaus from you know, the Mint to engraving and printing to the IRS to you know, OCC. So you have a a, you know, a very sort of different set of organizations delivering within the department. Can you talk from the departmental level, how do you approach actually moving sort of this group of organizations in the, in the same direction? Sure. Uh, for our strategic workforce planning efforts at the department level, we worked with the bureaus and uh, our HR subject matter experts to really identify key aspects of the workforce that we at Treasury could look at to help us articulate the risk to mission accomplishment. And so based on that data set, uh, we run reports, and as many of the panelists have already said, we don't rely on the surface data. So for example, with our retirements, everyone knows Treasury has a very aged workforce. And so we actually looked at how quickly people were retiring once they became eligible. And that was even more startling for our senior leadership. Many of our mission critical occupations take many years to become fully functional. And what we found in looking at the data was that people were retiring within one to four years of being eligible. And so in order to become fully performing, if that takes five years, we were going to be at risk. And so we started going deeper into the data and really looking at the impact of what that data was telling us as far as the workforce, but then we also looked at the risk to our HR programs. What was the state of our programs and are our programs able to deliver um, what the organization needs in terms of training, in terms of our ability to request flexibilities for hiring, in terms of restructuring. And we really put together candid structured conversations for our HR leaders in the bureaus to have uh, with their mission leadership to kind of change their narrative around HR and have leadership more embrace that uh, this whole process is a team sport. You know, Robert touched on um, sort of GAO's sort of view over, you know, a decade or more now on areas that need to be fixed. Can you, Kim, and, and uh, talk a little bit about, you know, what are, you know, what are the one or two things that you think are the most pressing yeah. need for change that you can 
require legislation in order to make that change. Well, I mean, to, to Robert's point, I think there's a lot of flexibilities people can use, mm -hmm. but what are the ones that you really do need Congress to step up and do something? Yeah, I mean, we talked a little bit about the GS system. Let's talk more specifically about classification. For the love of God, get rid of that system. I mean, it's, it's you know, IO psychologists, we talked a little bit about, um, that standard was last updated in 1968. Some things have changed since 1968, one or two. You know, it doesn't have, at last count, 33 of the occupations inside NASA or don't even exist within the 400 identified occupations. It takes 18 months to change a standard. And it's well-established practice. It's well-established things. And for all good reason, at one point in time, I'm just not sure it served us well right now going forward. If I have to wait 18 months to define a data scientist and I get to get it back to the moon in five years, <laughs> I'm doing the math and it gets a little bit difficult here, right? I mean, so that's one thing. You know, we've worked within the structure as much as we can. We've, we've cut time in half, we've cut labor in half, the investment I do, in classification. But even in its best, it's around a 30-day to get a job open. And all you're really doing is look at the bureaucracy between establishing structure and compensation. My competitors do it in a few hours. So even at the best of the government does it, we built the electronic tool that's across government, so I apologize to all the federal agencies in the room. That's a NASA product. I shouldn't have said that, actually. I should have blamed like Treasury. Um, so, <laughs> but I'm already 30 days behind the, the game, right? If I'm gonna be competitive for the best and the brightest in the world, and you don't get back to the moon with you know, uh, C players, you don't. It just doesn't happen that way. So those are some of the things that I think some we can do, some we need help with. And I would agree with that too. Yeah. The classification system would be a great place to start. Yeah. It's going to celebrate its 70th birthday um, <laughs> this October. So, yeah. um, you know, it goes, the, the law was passed in 1949, yeah. and it's extremely constraining for agencies. And one of the things that we found with skills gaps is that many of the issues, uh, agencies can address their problems with, with skills gaps. It wasn't so much that they weren't there in the federal government, it was more of a maldistribution as opposed mm -hmm. to an absence of them. So if we could move people around more yeah. easily, um, it could solve a lot of the uh, skills gap problems we face, either move people within agencies more easily, move, move people across agencies, or move people in and out of the government more, more easily. That would be huge. Kim, how about from a Treasury perspective, what, what would you change? Oh, if only. Uh, I would probably change uh, the support the HR community gets from Congress in terms of funding. Uh, HR is an area that's constantly cut um, when agencies are forced to shrink their budgets, and it puts HR at a disservice, and it really impacts our ability to um, assist the organization in meeting its mission. So we need to think about um, how we um, how HR is impacted by the budget cuts that are impacted on agencies. Kate, let me, let me go back to a comment you made about, you know, identifying the future leaders in an organization and, and put it in the context of sort of the federal workplace. So we, you know, we managed to get somebody eventually on board after probably eight months, right? Yeah, in a critical job. Or, or longer, yeah. But once we have them there, how do, how do you get an organization to actually start thinking the way you described about sort of identifying their skill sets and looking to the future about this person actually could be, you know, a top level manager in my organization? And how do you balance that with, you know, requirements with regard to EEO and you know, equity and all of that. How do you how do you make that balance? Yeah, I think that you know it comes back to how we're looking at the di data and and what's possible. And so a big part is I think we have this perception that you know anybody if they start here, if you give them enough training and development, they can get get there. And there's an opportunity to really take a strengths uh, first approach, where if we can 
you know, better understand when you were talking earlier about moving people from one agency to another, it's understanding that it's not that we don't have enough people that can, you know, have the potential to do that, it's that we're not reassigning them, we're not, um, we're making, we're, there's a misalignment sometimes in terms of what uh, we're actually trying to develop. And I, and I always go back to industrial organizational psychology just because there's so many decades of, of research in it. There is a difference between developing a coping strategy, developing, you know, that it's, it may not, it may take more time, it may take effort, it may not be an innate priority for somebody. They can develop a coping strategy, they can develop a, a how-to of a role, so a hard skill that can complement that role. That stuff is really effective in terms of thinking about personalized development, but it's, it's different than thinking that you're gonna take somebody who truly you know, their, their innate ability is going to be persuasion. So Andy in his role, you know, he uses persuasion every day. You're not gonna take somebody who, you know, really enjoys focusing on a process and focusing on supporting others and all of a sudden say, hey, we're just gonna put you in a role where you're gonna have to be persuasive and we'll give you lots of learning and development to get there. And so part of it is, first of all, starting from a place of, what is a good investment of energy and time into you know, training on the hard skill? What's a good investment on coming up with coping strategies versus how do we align people's strengths with new opportunities? If we know that they have the potential to, to excel in a new role, repurpose somebody, uh, uh, then when you take the money to upskill them and to complement with the, the hard skills, then it's a much better investment. You can get somebody excelling in that role much faster. And so, you know, I, th I think it comes down to what's the starting data? How are we evaluating? Um, the old career ladder, I'm just gonna take a sales example because everybody can relate to it. You know, if somebody was a business development representative, well then, of course, they can become an account executive, and if they're good at hitting their quota, we're gonna make them a people leader, and now they can manage a whole bunch of people, because those are, are related, and not at all. So I think it's about changing, <laughs> I think it's about changing the mind frame that when we really think about this transitioning of the workforce, it's moving the mentality, first and foremost, from the career ladder to this career lattice. How do we repurpose people? And it's not just about checking a whole bunch of boxes, it's starting with what's the foundation that we're starting with. If we have people that have been really good um, at servicing customers, well then what other roles where they would get a sense of self-worth serving other people? You know, it may be a different job title and it may have different hard skills, but if we can repurpose that innate talent first and foremost, it's gonna be a better return on investment and it's going to help us fill these critical gaps. Um, and so for, for me, it's just focusing on what data is driving these decisions and really encouraging us to, you know, in the past we couldn't necessarily make uh, decisions about people's potential because there wasn't a way of quantifying it. Industrial that's, or, yeah. That's awesome. You know, in the federal side, this gets back to the classification discussion, right? If you want to be promoted, you have to manage people. So what happens, you take a great technical leader and you put them in a position of managing people. And if you were going to envision probably the people least suited sometimes to managing people, it might be some of your technical folks because they really don't like people at all, <laughs> right? They, they, they are fully ingrained with their project or their program or their process. But getting back to the structure we have to operate within, that's the behavior at every federal agency is we promote you to the point of, you know, of your incompetency in some levels. Let me, we have a little over five minutes and I think we've had some Great. good conversation here. So let me, let me open it up for, for the audience for questions. Who you're doing that for. Also, the concern is is that 
if you look around the diversity of this room, age, sex, race, religion, and all these other intangible things that you can't measure impact that person's ability to do a particular skill. So unless you get all of that data for a longer period of time and see a person can evolve one way or the, or the other, I believe we send ourselves up on a slippery slope to begin to discriminate against the workforce. Or the workforce have an inherent uh, possibility of being dis dis discriminated against because of these external factors that have never been taken into consideration, if that makes sense to you. Yeah, can I, can I answer yeah. with that? So when I think about somebody being evaluated, whether or not we admit it, we make judgment calls about people when we see where they went to school. We make judgment calls about when we see who they've worked with before. We, we as humans, are looking to de-risk our decisions. And so we go with what we can hold on to. And if we're familiar with you know, a school based in you know, a, a state that we're familiar with versus a state that we don't know about or somebody that's, that's come in um, and, and they started out lives somewhere else and, and we don't recognize that school altogether, we're making judgments about people based on you know, what's on their resume and, and what's on their, pro, you know, their, their work history. And the problem is that data has been shown to only introduce bias, that it doesn't actually help us make an educated decision about understanding if they'll perform well in the job. So right now the data we're using and these old outdated structures are full of bias. And we know that, that age and race and gender are all impacting that data on the piece of paper. And so that's, it's, it's already an uneven playing field. The thing about bringing in psychology is that it's a new measurement that actually predicts performance. And it's, it's um, if you look at it holistically, not just one element of behavior, but a combination of behaviors in order to uh, evaluate something like innovation, for instance, there, there's no data to show that men or women or certain ages are more innovative than others. It's a measurement that is, it doesn't have that innate bias in it. And so it's actually allowing us to look at, and in everyone in this room, there will be you know, a certain percentage of this room that prioritizes innovation over others. And when we look at that group of people, we will see far more diversity in that group than if we were to start looking at you know, who has the most years of education or the most work experience or working at you know, certain, group, certain types of employers that we think have a higher status. And so it's an opportunity to finally use an unbiased set of data to help us identify. And that's why I used potential earlier. We're really trying to look at judging people based on potential and giving everybody an opportunity to rise. So I think it's one of the best things we have going when we look at diversity and inclusion. Right back here, back. Yes, uh, our bike is, uh, what is the plan uh, advising the GS system. What, in other words, what can't we replace it with? And how will it benefit human capital? So I'm assuming that came from a person. I can't, the lights, I can't see. Um, I think the next session will be waterboarding after the bright lights. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I think we have to look at the alternatives. You know, we have to look at what works on the private sector and really define that in a way that would make sense in the federal structure. Um, accepted service. Um, half of the federal workforce right now are working under accepted service, accepted from some of the provisions of Title V. But you can't run into that and lose some of the protections. You have to be consistent with merit systems principles. You have to ensure that you're not con conducting prohibited personnel practices. You know, there are things in labor relations that have to be adhered to. So I think some modified measure of accepted service that allows market sensitive understanding of pay and competition would be an alternative. Um, you know, we continue to work on sort of proposals and ideas and thoughts. Um, not there yet, but that's just an idea. Time for one more. Yes, sir. You mentioned that uh, using data about a person's behavior and their innate talent will help to improve performance in the long run. But I see two major challenges right here. Number one, a federal government agency prepared and capable of collecting that kind of data from the front end. 
then secondly, as you said earlier, going to uh, personalize the position. In other words, the position begins to grow, to adapt to this new individual who has all kinds of talents that you may not have had before and can really grow the organization. Yeah. So, so those are two things. Personalization of yep. the position, which is something that government doesn't do very well. But you can approach that a different way though, right? You can go away from the position-based structured system to a person and competency-based system, which I think is what you're talking about. Um, it's really looking at the capabilities, the knowledge, skills, and abilities of the individual, and then mapping them in with the organization, screening them into positions rather than screening them out. So I think there's an alternative there. Additionally, are we ready to use data in a way that's actionable for leadership? I'd say maybe. You know, I think we're starting down that road right now. Some agencies are further along than others um, in, that, in that journey. But you're right, that's the, well, the data architecture has to be right first. So those are great questions. Thank you. So when you talk about legislative changes and you talk about funding, I agree those are two huge issues. How do we get there, right? So every agency is struggling with that. How do we get there? Really large bake sale. No, wait, that probably won't work. You know, I think it comes from everybody as a human capital professional and the work informing their leadership of their challenges. Yeah. You know, in a, as a community, a lot of times we suffer in silence, right? We'll go get the job done regardless of the barriers you place in front of me. Maybe that isn't the, that's a great short-term answer. Maybe long-term that isn't the best way to attack that problem. Um, you know, and I will tell you that, you know, OMB and OPM have been good partners from the agency perspective but their hands are kind of tied too. So, you know, um, having your agency understand the problem and having them inform their stakeholders, and then conversations like this, you know, where we all get together and have the opportunity to share some ideas. Yeah, and I also yeah. think GAO. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I, I would add to that role. too. I, you know, when our conversations with the Hill, I mean, the narrative, the narrative has changed. You know, no, no congressman or senator has been reelected by fighting for the classification system. So, you know. And yet so, it still exists. And, and, right. And, 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 still and, exists. and this is why. I mean, I think partly it's, it's, you know, it's ignored. It's not given the attention it deserves. So the conversations we have, the opening point is on mission. And that's why you see in a lot of our reports is the relationship between an agent. You know, that's what GAO does. We tend to point out where agencies are, are falling short but we're also making our team sensitive to the human capital piece of that. So, you know, you may not care about the classification system, but members of Congress and every senator has VA hospitals within their state or within their district. And so we've kind of reversed it. Focus on the mission first, make sure that agencies are performing for their, their constituents, and then you back into the, the human capital piece. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much.